am Dom Adam Santos, uh, and it brings me great joy to celebrate the culmination of hard work, creativity, and impact of our uh, new cohort of visiting fellows. When we launched the CRJ in fall of 2021, we had a dream of creating an innovative and cross-disciplinary hub in which social justice change makers, scholars, and students work collaboratively to develop new tools and strategies in the pursuit of racial justice, resulting in better policy solutions and the cultivation of the next generation of high impact leaders and thinkers. We were especially eager to engage individuals whose perspectives and tools are sometimes undervalued, sidelined, or wholly absent from traditional policy circles and conversations. The Visiting Fellows Program, the signature initiative of our center, beautifully encapsulates this vision. The fellowship offers a cohort of four, uh, of three racial justice leaders, advocates, and scholars a highly competitive fellowship designed to recognize their transformative work to date and provide opportunities to strengthen their impact within the policy landscape. Most notably, our program gives fellows the time, space, and resources to create and produce catalyst projects that have clear potential to inform public debate, policy development, and scholarly analysis. Such resources could only be possible in partnership uh, with our foundation uh, partner, uh, the Mellon Foundation, and we thank them so much for supporting our cohort of fellows. So now for introductions. Uh, Amanda Alexander is a racial justice lawyer, historian, and organizer who founded and served as the executive director of the Detroit Justice Center, a movement lawyering organization dedicated to creating economic opportunities, transforming the legal system, and promoting just cities. She is co-authoring a book that provides strategies for movement organizers, lawyers, and activists to build community power and influence social change. And Alexander is passionate about training the next generation of activists and exploring how to tell stories of historical and contemporary organizing through film. Next, Charlene Carruthers is a writer, filmmaker, or community organizer, and Black Studies PhD candidate at Northwestern University. She is the founding national director of Black Youth Project 100 and author of the best-selling book, Unapologetic, A Black Queer and Feminist Mandate for Radical Movements. She is developing her plenum project, a film exploring the 1995 Black Nations Queer Nations Conference. The film addresses themes such as the HIV AIDS epidemic, black family dynamics, and the intersections of queer, trans, and racial justice. Drawing on the legacy of past black LGBTQ plus activists, Carruthers aims to drive public discourse and challenge regressive policies through her work. And lastly, uh, Bianca Wilson is an associate professor in the Department of Social Welfare at the Luskin School of Public Affairs and an affiliate faculty member of the California Center for Population Research at UCLA. Her forthcoming book, based on 100 interviews with economically marginalized queer individuals, seeks to uncover the structural and social barriers contributing to poverty among LGBTQ communities. Wilson's research aims to highlight the overlooked role of structural racism and LGBTQ poverty with the hope of inspiring policy changes that better address these challenges. So as you've heard, these are three very dynamic and inspiring racial justice change makers who we are so honored to support and be in community with. I'll now turn it over to our founding director and dean of the Ford School, Dr. Celeste Watkins Hayes, who will moderate what I know will be a rich conversation at the intersection of policy and activism. And uh, after the conversation, we'll turn it over to the audience members to ask questions and, uh, and continue the conversation with a catered reception at the end. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dom, for those wonderful introductions. And as I look out on this group, I just can't think of a better way to end um, the day. Uh, I know for many of you it has been long and you've gotten so many things uh, put on your plate and you've added things to your plate. And the fact that you decided to spend the, the end part of your day here 
um, and to come in the rain. I just want us to all get cozy together mm -hmm. and have a conversation about issues that we care so deeply about. So <clears throat> I'm just excited that this is how we get to, to end our work day in, in, in deep conversation. So um, by way of introductions, just to set the table, um, let me just share that at the Center for Racial Justice, as you all know, we bring visiting fellows in um, every year. And we don't necessarily plan a theme, but as the applications came in, it became really clear that activism was needing, what needed to be our theme um, because of the way that we could bring you all into this conversation and into this space. So we're gonna ask a number of questions on that um, topic. So I wonder, by way of introductions, if each of you could share more about your Catalyst project. So essentially the fellows are here this year to work on a Catalyst project, something that has the potential to move the needle forward in terms of the conversation on racial justice. And they can be all kinds of mediums, memoirs, books, um, monographs, uh, research, you know, teaching materials, films, um, artistic productions, et cetera. So I wonder, Amanda, if we can start with you. And can you tell us about your Catalyst project? What do you have planned? What do you have envisioned? Sure. Uh, so it's so good to be here uh, with you guys and to see familiar faces, um, longtime organizing friends uh, from here in Michigan. So uh, I'll get into my project, but I thought I'd give some context on kind of like how I'm arriving into this program. So I am coming off of what I've called a year of rest. <laughs> I was you know, doing organizing work, uh, I was a direct legal services attorney, movement lawyer, executive director uh, for 20 plus years of movement work. And last summer, after seven years of building and leading the Detroit Justice Center, handed it off to new leadership and wasn't sure what was gonna come next. But I knew that I was pretty burnt out after being in the work uh, for a couple decades and that I needed to figure out how to rest and how to stay in this work for the long haul. It was also really important to me to model uh, breaking free of founder syndrome. So this idea that you are so <coughs> essential to this organization and this movement, that'll just fall <laughs> apart without you. And what you see is people staying in these roles for 20, 30, 40 years um, and just kind of strangling a lot of possibility and a lot of you know, roles that younger new leadership could come into. So I wanted to model something different. Um, I also, it was really important to me to build an organization that felt different, that felt more sustainable. So by the end of our time, of the end of the five years of leading DJC, we had a four day work week. Um, so these were attorneys doing incredible work, showing up for organizers and folks, and doing it in a four day work week. We had a communications policy where we were not on call for each other 24 seven. We you know, left at the end of the day, and unless it was a true emergency, <laughs> and, the, and those came up sometimes, but unless it was a true emergency, you were expected to be you know, doing whatever you wanted to do. Have the evening, be with your family, be with your kids, go out dancing, whatever you wanted to do that was gonna have you feel fresh the next morning. Um, we had a sabbatical policy. I knew that after those years of leading, I needed a break, and so I assumed that every other member of the team also needed a break. And so after five years, folks get three months off to do whatever they want to do, whatever makes their spirit come alive. And so um, part of also why I stepped away was wanting to model seasonal leadership. And there's this beautiful article by the IME Institute um, that says, leaders, organizations, and movements have seasons, and it's important to know which one you're in. And the idea is that just like the earth, just like everything has seasons and cycles, so do we as people in movements. And they said, you know, on average, a leader goes through a cycle every seven years. It's longer for movements. It's like 10 or 15 years for movements. But part of the problem and part of why we're so burnt out in this work is that we're expected to be in this perpetual summer, right? Like funders expect us to always be building and growing and innovating. And yet these seasons of fall and winter are just as important to your own creativity, your own sense of purpose. Um, and so I'm coming off of this year of rest and I'm really thankful to be able to ease back into <laughs> work you know, with the support of this fellowship. And so um, some things that are on my mind, one is thinking about you know, what have I learned about rest, about pacing ourselves in movement work, um, about being in this for the long haul over the past year that might be worth sharing out with other folks. Um, that's on my mind. 
I'm also co-authoring a book on movement lawyering um, with my dear friend and comrade Porvi Shaw, who leads Movement Law Lab. Um, we were approached um, by a press this summer that said, why aren't there more books on movement lawyering? Um, and really the idea of movement lawyering is we are taking our cues from organizers, um, organizers for you know, racial justice, for any number of issues. But the idea is that lawyers, so often we are trained in a way that ends up dulling the radical energy of movements, that you know, tramples on the freedom dreams of organizers, and that ultimately creates dependency instead of builds power. And so um, you know, the Detroit Justice Center was an experiment in movement lawyering and showing up for organizers differently. Um, but Porvi and I will be you know, working for the next couple of years, but starting this year, on what we're calling a field guide to movement lawyering. Mm -hmm. So we want it to be really practical for um, new lawyers to the field, to, seize, to seasoned lawyers, um, and also be rooted in theory, history as well. So that's, that'll be a big part of the um, Catalyst project. And then the last part, I, when I was at DJC, one of my favorite things in the last couple of years was a podcast um, that we had called Freedom Dreams, where I was getting to talk with organizers across the country who are building a better world right now. You know, our tagline was, we know a better world is possible because we're talking to the people who are building it. Mm -hmm. And so it got me really interested in storytelling and narrative. And so I'm interested in exploring possibilities around documentary. Like this shouldn't just be a podcast. It should be um, you know, short documentaries. It should be film. But I'm also, as, as a historian, I'm interested in telling better stories about how social change actually happens. Um, because when I teach movement lawyering or law and social justice, a lot of it is just telling people the basics of what community organizing is and how to build power and disabusing people of the idea that it's often charismatic male leaders. <laughs> um, you know, or, or these singular figures who have this epiphany one day and take a brave action and then you know, the courts crumble and everything changes and it's no, no, no. <laughs> this, is, this is years of, of investment by people building collective power. And so how do we tell better stories when it comes to feature films as well about how change happens? So I'll be working on that as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, oh. wonderful. Thank you so much, yeah. Bianca. Right. And there's some, there's some follow-up <laughs> questions. <laughs> there's some follow-up questions I'm gonna come back to cool. in just yeah. a minute, yeah. but Bianca. <laughs> I don't feel quite that concise about my <laughs> okay. project or background, so just a heads up. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, as, as Dawn mentioned, um, you know, I'm working on a book um, based on a set of interviews I did, but I think I'd also like to provide some context of how I came not just to that, but then to, not just to do the work, but then to this as a catalyst project for this fellowship. For me, I'd say this has been a year of transition and, and change in that um, I recently returned to a traditional academic position. So about 14 years ago, I was an assistant or associate professor, um, recently tenured in a psychology department, traditional position. And I really felt, you know, I was trained in community intervention work. Like this is the way that you apply research to community change is through health interventions, through services, um, all valid ways of applying research to make change. But I really wanted to contribute to policy. I felt like the work I was doing in HIV prevention and sexual health research in um, uh, lesbian sex culture, that many of the <clears throat> health disparities um, were so clearly tied to more structural issues. And rather than kind of modeling that in my research, I wanted to focus on policy as a way of intervening to address those factors directly. So at that point, I left a tenured position and joined as full-time research faculty at the Williams Institute at UCLA, where I worked for 13 years. Um, so this was you know, an exciting move for me, a great opportunity, where a lot of the kind of strategy for creating change in a movement that had very little data available mm -hmm. to provide um, awareness, context, demonstrate presence in society, uh, you know, these data were needed in order to inform 
um, marriage equality? You know, how, how many uh, LGBT families are there? How many LGBT people there are? You know, so that was the kind of work that the Institute was doing when I joined. And I added to that work by looking at, um, you know, establishing the presence of those data or the availability of those data in foster care, the child welfare system, um, incarceration, and um, worked with folks in LGBT poverty. So again, you know, domains where not a lot of data existed and having the data is the way that change was happening. And so over, you know, 10, 13 years of doing this work, um, I worked with a colleague, Lee Badgett, on, again, analysis of survey data, looking at LGBT poverty, demonstrated what we already knew, that LGBT people experience economic insecurity, poverty at higher levels. Um, but I found myself, you know, kind of saying the same thing to people. LGBT people experience these disparities, but we didn't have a lot of answers as to why and how. Mm -hmm. In what way does sexual orientation and gender identity matter in creating those disparities? Uh, so I felt the data need in the interest of change was shifting because we had already done such a great job over the years at establishing like that basic quantitative population knowledge, but we didn't have a lot of information on the mechanisms. And so that led my colleagues and I to do a study, a qualitative study across two counties in California, looking at the experiences of low income queer folks, um, you know, those experiencing various forms of economic instability to understand not only their experiences with, with economic related or social services, but also to understand kind of their life narratives and where and at what points in their lifetimes of economic insecurities um, come up, including in childhood, and what were the factors and like where do these kind of big issues like structural racism, uh, discrimination related to sexual orientation, gender expression, gender identity, where do those things come up in their, in their lifetime? So that was the project, but I was still in a place that, you know, understandably needed to be very applied, and the goal is to just get the data out. The policy advocates will do what they need to do. The activists will do what they need to do with it. Um, but I felt like, these data and much of the research I had done over the years in system involvement, incarceration, foster care, were actually pointing to a theoretical void and um, kind of a, a lack of our conceptual understanding still of where and at what time points the various isms actually produce these inequalities. And you know, that was a signal for me for a need for this transition, not only in, um, you know, the workplace, you know, kind of coming out of a more applied research center and I'm back into a more traditional academic department, but that's really what led to this project and this Catalyst project that I felt there was more to say about the data that might help provide a more conceptual or theoretical foundation for the way we approach strategies related to economic inequality, particularly for those that are at the intersection of being sexual and gender minorities and racialized peoples. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you for that. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Charlene, tell us about your project. Well, first, again, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I was looking at the, the tagline. I was like, oh, writer and filmmaker. Interesting. <laughs> it's correct. And it's like, how do I, I, I'm consistently trying to figure out how to talk about mm -hmm. what it is that I do. Part of it is, I think, being a, a new mother, a new parent, and figuring out who I am and how um, being also in a PhD program, being somewhere in movement, being a writer, being a, an educator, it's like, how do I even talk about what it is that I care about and what I do? And so this Catalyst Project, in many ways, is an embodiment, or will be an embodiment when, once it's on the screen. Not even once it's on the screen, because the whole process for me is an embodiment of my values and the different types of work that I do. Um, so to, in the interest of giving a little bit of background on how I got there, I remember uh, when I first fell in love with films. 
I was living in New York at the time, and I would just go see every single one of Ava DuVernay's releases on, back then it was called, I think it was called uh, Affirm, or it had a different name, her distribution company. And I would just, I, and I would see films just all the time. I would go see something, I, I, I would spend the entire day just going to see different films or different movies. And what it really was about was about my love for story. And I would, I, I would repeat things as, as typical for me, just I'm not good at this. I would say, I'm not good at telling stories. I don't know how to tell stories. And then I realized that that wasn't true <laughs> because I was an organizer. And any good organizer, and I was a damn good organizer. I guess I still am, yeah. <laughs> still am a good organizer, good community organizer. And any organizer worth their salt is good at telling a story. Right? and engaging people through stories. And it doesn't have to be a grandiose story or a story about a huge civil disobedience, but a story, you're a good storyteller who can connect with another person where you're able to discern what they care about through sharing and sharing what you care about and seeing perhaps or being able to discern the connections in what you both care about. So then that then can be a catalyst for the work that you all may be able to do together. It's on the basis of shared values and shared, shared interests. And oftentimes, those shared values and those shared interests, there's some angst in the middle of it or at the root of it, something that makes you angry, something that agitates you. And that, for many people, not just, but I'm not talking about guilt or shame. I'm talking about the thing that moves you, right? You think about the agitation cycle in a, um, in a washing machine, right? It, it spins, it spins, just moves, and things move at different speeds. Agitation can happen in many ways. And so I was consistently engaged in the work of telling stories. And so at some point, I don't know, I think it was in the early, wow, this, I mean, the early 2010s. <laughs> like, what is that? What does that even mean now, <laughs> the early 2010s? <laughs> wow. Um, I said, I want to I be a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I would like to actually make a film. But filmmaking is expensive, right? It's very, it's an expensive mm -hmm art form, very, it, can be, it can be a very expensive art form. And I, I remember in watching um, the films released on Ava DuVernay's distribution company, Bradford Young was the director of photography on at least one of them, maybe two of them that I saw. And Bradford Young is an incredible cinematographer. It's incredible, his, his, his eye is out of this world. And that is expensive <laughs> to work with a cinematographer who also um, has a great eye uh, and to produce beautiful films. Um, it, 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 it can cost a coin. But then I, I received this fellowship from the Margaret E. Casey Foundation, the Freedom Fellowship, Freedom Scholars Fellowship. And I was like, this is my moment to actually make this thing. And so I wrote and directed the film called, uh, the, titled The Funnel. And I wrote it in uh, my graduate program for in my Black Expressive Arts and Culture class with uh, Dr. Alex uh, Wahelia. And I wrote it for an assignment, and then it just matched up with the fellowship. And for me, just like in organizing, The Funnel is a story about this young black woman living in Chicago who has this spiritual experience with one of her ancestors um, that connects her to the past and to the future. And um, it's been screened all in many parts of the world at this point, not on the continent of Africa yet. Um, which I can't say worldwide, frankly. Um, but it's been screened in many parts of, of the world, but it was about telling a more complete story about black people's lives on the, along the lines of the housing crisis um, in the 1940s, black queer and trans people, Chicago, all of those things. And so film has become, for me, a medium to tell more complete stories about black people's lives in service of creating more complete solutions towards uh, the problems, the ongoing <clears throat> problems, really the, um, uh, not just problems seems really light, but the torment that we experience across this planet from uh, various forces. And my Catalyst project, I also wrote the screenplay in a Black Studies graduate course and <laughs> thank, thank you to my professors for allowing me to do that. Um, but we read a piece by Denise Fajida da Silva, uh, is, I think it was titled Plenum, and it plays on some things of time. And I also at that time read uh, Jafari Allen's book, There's a Disco Ball in Between Us. 
and he has this amazing monologue by um, Essex Hemphill. And Essex Hemphill gave this, this speech at the Black Nations Queer Nations Conference in 1995. And um, there's a documentary, you can see it, it's, it's online, it's available, it's like $5 to watch online. And so I'll get the, the director's name, um, on, I'll share the director's name on my next round. And I love telling stories about black folks, like I, I love period pieces, I love a period piece. And it just honestly just all came together for me, the story. I was like, how can I make up a story about Black Nations Queer Nations Conference, about the HIV and AIDS crisis, and bring Chicago into it. Though I am not a nationalist, people call me a Chicago nationalist all day. <laughs> um, how can I bring Chicago into the story? How can I bring a story about black families, knowing that this, uh, and the, this conference that happened next year, 35 years ago, will be the 35th anniversary. How can I bring this conference in which they ask questions about how can we understand blackness and queerness beyond the nation? How do we understand blackness and queerness? And I think those questions right now in this moment about nationhood, about queerness, about blackness, are all at the, foref are at the forefront of our politics as we once again face the possibility of another black person becoming president of the United States of America, a black woman of also, who is also of Indian descent, not just Indian descent, it's Indian as well. All of these things are questions. How do we relate to the United States of America? And so for me, this film, though it takes place in 1995, it is really about bringing, again, playing with time as we do in black studies and as black people, playing with time, taking us to the past in order to bring us into conversations that are relevant right now. And so my hope with the film uh, is that just like the funnel, it will be an educational piece for people. I will be, be able to engage people um, internationally and also expand. We were talking earlier about how do we even understand how HIV and AIDS impacts black communities. Um, what Dr. Uh, Kathy Cohen calls the boundaries of blackness, how we even understand blackness and understand that this is a holistic matter that predates and also uh, follows the crisis and the, the, the epidemic as well. So I'm really excited about the opportunity to um, make another film and be able to really live out uh, what I love to do is telling stories. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for that. So I, I want to ask a question that's going to sound very um, elementary, but um, there's, there's complexity that I know you all will tease out. And you started along these lines, Charlene, as you talked about um, the agitation. I wonder if you each can define what is activism? What is community organizing? What's involved? And I wonder if you can define it and ponder the question, are those terms currently overused? Um, or are you happy with the number of instances, people, et cetera, that claim the term of activist, activism, community, organizer? How do you think about the very definition of what you do and what it is? Well, maybe I'll go first as the least probably activist identified <laughs> person. Give it a shot. Um, I won't touch the community organizer part. Um, but in terms of activism, I mean, this, this comes up a lot as an academic mm -hmm. who it does. is engaged in action research and kind of the push and pull and concerns around uh, genuine commitment to change yeah. within an academic setting. And even the use of the term scholar activists. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and yes, and like yeah. what it, and the lack of validity of that in both activist circles and scholarly circles. So, you know, for, for me, and you know, even as I described earlier, um, kind of my own movement through thinking about the role of data and empirical sciences, in social change. Um, and then I moved from thinking about community intervention work to policy work. Still all of that is, is challenged within a non-academic activist space. But what I talk to students about, what I talk to um, also my colleagues who are advocates and activists is that we have to come at it from 
multiple sides. And while there are certain problems or facets of certain problems that require um, actions like demonstrations, actions um, that involve litigation, you know, other policy development, <clears throat> we can name many actions throughout history that simply required accurate information about who the problem was about and documenting their experiences, whether we're talking about Clark and Clark and Brown versus the Board of Education to when I think of a lot of the work related to LGBT movement, a lot of that was pushed forward or Burgerfell. It was citing the existence of gay families in the US. It was cited in um, like the decisions talked about, the significance of knowing and documenting. that Ida yeah, B. Wells' work on lynching, right? Yeah. Documenting yeah. lynching. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then at a much smaller level, like a non federal level, um, just in LA County, the biggest barrier to caring about queer youth in foster care is the administrators kept saying they're not in the system, mm -hmm. they don't exist. And yet the social workers were all like, mm, they do. <laughs> and it seemed, and it feels like there's a lot. <laughs> and, the, and the higher up administrators were like, no, then not even here, it's like regular. And then when my colleagues and I did that first study, and that was the first study to use population-based methods to document how many LGBT youth were in the foster care system, and we said, look, there's 20%, that's twice as many as the general population, then they had to listen to that. So, you know, that's where I enter like a world of mm -hmm. activism is more from a perspective that we all have a part to play mm -hmm. and that there are some components of change needed that simply require accurate information that even the people that are working against you can't refute. And sometimes use against you. So sometimes you use your own data against you. But the, the issue is the methodology wasn't refuted and it was respected and, and that's important. I think yeah, I'll, I'll, I will can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I think the distinction for me between activism and organizing is I think it comes down to organizing being about collective action. Mm. Like I think of it as like an activist can be an activist, you know, um, someone who is agitating for change, who is outspoken about certain issues, who's is an activist within their field, their workplace, their profession. But organizing is about so you know, when I teach movement lawyering, we have a movement lawyering theory of change that is very much about getting lawyers to understand organizing. So mm. you know, sustainable social change is about directly impacted people leading their own struggles and taking collective action to change the conditions of oppression and building power along the way. And so that, I mean, that to me is what organizing is. It's about mobile, it's about you know, getting collective action going, and I think part of the biggest issue that we see with lawyers who try and show up for movements is that they don't respect <laughs> or understand everything that goes into organizing. Mm -hmm. You know, we, I was working with attorneys and training them, you know, when folks took to the streets in 2020, and we had 200 lawyers from Metro Detroit step up and say, I want to defend activists. Like, they were being swept up by police and so needed training in how to, you know, defend them in court. And we did a movement lawyering 101 training for them because they would rock up to the protest and say, well, you know, it's, it's, nice, it's great that you all have turned out, but I've been working on the issue of um, qualified immunity for years now, and so can we just add a you know, demand to your protest you know, demands here? It's like, no, 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 you don't understand what it took to get thousands of people out in the street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't understand what kind of relationship building that took, all the one-on-ones, all the canvassing, all the phone calls. And so you know, that is the work of organizing. And it's about helping, in my case, lawyers better understand and respect that. And then learn to take your cues from people with that level of expertise. Because mm -hmm. that's one of the things you mentioned at the beginning that I wanted to unpack when you said movement lawyers and their relationship to organizers. So I could easily imagine that scenario play out where we're all in this together. We all want to see the needle move forward. And here are the things that I want to add yeah. to the agenda. And here's how what I've been working on, I kind of want to superimpose. Yep. And that navigation and negotiation it sounds like it's really complex, right? The tricky thing is people are kind of dazzled by the law 
or legal tools or legal tactics. Mm -hmm. you know? And so there's a real danger that people start asking this question like, okay, who do we sue? Mm. Um, and we know that litigation, lawsuits, they have this dulling effect. You know, as soon as you know, people are taken to the streets, they're organizing, they're thinking about all sorts of different tactics. And then lawyers decide we're going to file a lawsuit against the police department. And that's going to unfold over the next seven to 10 years. You know? And suddenly the energy shifts from getting out into the streets, making our demands to, well, when's the next court date? What's the update on the case? On the case. Everyone should come out and turn out and put pressure on the courts. Let's do court watching. And you just see all of this energy get drained. And all of this radical possibility in terms of what can we build right now? What are the mutual aid networks we can build? You know, how do we think about affordable housing? What's the abolitionist presence look like? All these other questions that were in those early meetings become drained because lawyers didn't know their place. <laughs> So yeah, it's an ongoing negotiation with ourselves and with each other about what is our what's what is everybody's place within this. Um, so activism, in the way I understand it, is what what you all are saying, and what I'll add to it is that anyone can be an activist, and it is quite value neutral. Like you could be an activist on any set of issues, leftists. Uh, radicals, socialists, anarchists, communists, <laughs> feminists, etc., <cetera, clears throat> do not own activism any more than we, they, wherever I fit in that universe, own community organizing. So activism is absolutely like an individual, and sometimes even groups of people um, taking action, expressing a set of values, and something that they want to see out in the world. And it may or may not address structural oppression at all. It might, and sometimes it, it, it may very well be like ad, in support of advancing mm -hmm. structural oppression. Like the folks who stand outside of abortion <clears throat> clinics, they're activists. Yeah. The antis, the anti-choice people, they are activists, right? And some of them are actually organizers too. And by organizing, to extend on what Amanda shared, it is about collective action. And what you also named was like leadership development. Like training, offering movement, lawyering one-on-one -on -one is a leadership development opportunity. That is a core aspect of community organizing and a distinction that you can make. Like having folks show up for you know, a mass protest, a mass action, great, we need them. We actually, we absolutely need them. And if, and oftentimes, there is no follow-up, and sometimes that's okay, but actually that's a big weakness of ours um, in our movements. The, the organizing comes into play with the people who were on the clipboard, who are followed up, um, by, uh, followed up with by someone, invited to a meeting, uh, invited to a training, invited to a one-on-one, -on -one, which was a relational meeting, um, which I, what, which I spoke to earlier about us having a conversation, an intentional conversation about who we are, what we care about, and potentially about opportunities for us to take action together. And so um, the, organ, the leadership development aspect is a, a, a huge distinction uh, in the community, uh, between community organizing and activism. And as someone who has like, firmly had um, um, myself within the community organizing realm, I found it quite challenging to be more of an activist because I'm like, oh, okay, the one-off things, they make me feel a little unstable. Mm. And at the same time, I think they're so important. Like sometimes mm. people will only show up once or twice, but the job of the organizer is to continue to harness that energy in the cycles, the ebbs and the flows because it's not gonna always be 2020. It's not going to always be 2013 or 2014, right? And I don't know what 2025 is going to look like. And the last thing I want to say about activism and organizing is that even it is not guaranteed that people, even if you are actively organizing to expand like people's access to their full dignity, that people are going to be on your side or that they're going to be okay with what you're doing, there's no one form of activism that is absolutely going to be acceptable. Palestinians marching in the streets was unacceptable. 
Palestinian children throwing rocks was unacceptable. Um, uh, Palestinians breathing for some people, unacceptable. And I think about how no matter what level of the organizing happening in certain contexts, they can be used to justify genocide. They could be used to justify policing coming in. I mean, we're here at the University of Michigan where students and faculty and staff have been engaged in anti-genocide and pro-Palestinian protests. I imagine for other groups too, in uh, Sudan and Democratic Republic of Congo, and possibly for Haiti as well here. But I know that there's been campus repression here as well. And so I, it don't matter what y'all do. You could just, I mean, there were some students, I think it was at, at Cornell recently, who were just at the library. It was either Cornell, it was one of the Ivies, Cornell or Harvard. And they just had signs on their laptops in the library, and that was unacceptable. So there's no <clears throat> acceptable form of activism, of organizing. No matter how light you are, no matter how heavy you are, someone's going to have a problem with it. And at the end of the day, if it is collective action, for me, that expands folks' access to their dignity, deepens our relationships, deepens our like ongoing struggles for liberation, and it doesn't restrict people's access to dignity. That's the kind of activism and organizing that I'm interested in. And I think when we like start to put a pin on it or identify certain forms of activism and organizing that counter that, we can identify the stuff that is repressive, that is replicating systems of oppression and can even get like make us a lot sharper and create way more discernment and frankly more imagination for our freedom dreams mm -hmm. um, if, 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 we're, if we make some of those types of distinctions in our work. So let me pick up on that because in the past decade, we've witnessed a surge in racial and gender awareness in mainstream discourse, exemplified by movements like Me Too, Black Lives Matter, as well as uh, policy movements such as the legalization of same-sex marriage in 2015. At the same time, this period has seen an increase in book bans, anti-DEI legislation, uh, and more exp explicit expressions of racism, homophobia, transphobia, and misogyny. So how, how do you each interpret the current political landscape where, to your point, Charlene, there's a lot of activism happening on a lot of different issues. How, how do you <coughs> see this landscape in this current moment that we are in? Whoever wants to start first can jump in. Yeah, I could continue on my soapbox or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or you let you want to go. Either one. Either one. <laughs> I mean, my goodness, the moment we're living in right now, um, this era where I think peop more people on this continent are experiencing the impact of climate change. Because some people have been feeling it for quite some time. Yeah. Right. Some people been feeling it. Some people, I live in Atlanta where 20 miles away from where, a little bit over 20 miles from where I live, a chemical plant exploded or uh, set, was set, went, uh, set fire. A fire was set. Ah, English is hard sometimes for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I caught fire. Caught fire. That's what happened. Um, and uh, they, they produce uh, pool cleaning products. And so the air smelled of chlorine. It was huge plumes. They shut down the highway in a particular area. Now, we know that to be true in different parts of this country um, where this has happened before, right? Um, so climate change, ongoing, like human aggravated, human manufactured catastrophes, things that don't have to be are happening right now. Um, entire towns are being raised in parts of North Carolina, in Tennessee right now. And at the same time, we know people in what's called the global south have been disproportionately experiencing the impact of climate change for decades now, right? And so that's why I really note that it's more people experiencing it, because there are many people who have been experiencing it for quite some time. So that shapes our political context that we're in right now, and it absolutely has policy implications, um, both in the federal government, on down on every level, across every level of government here in this country, it also has implications on the international stage. The things that this country opts into and opts out of conveniently or signs up to and then takes it back or doesn't sign up for. I think the United States is 
in this moment, the odd country out alongside Great Britain on so many issues. Like we consistently vote against the interests of the rest of the world and the United Nations. That's a problem. And I actually don't, I mean, the data even shows that that's not reflective of the majority of people in this country, like what people actually agree with, at least from the polls that I've seen. Um, and even the data that they, uh, various, uh, um, and I cannot conjugate these data, the data, this data. So I'm like listening to you, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I don't really it's do that. Yeah, yeah, these data, thank you. We get it. Yeah, <laughs> I guess I'm in the humanities, then, you know, so we don't really, <laughs> I don't really do that a lot that much with data. Um, in that way, that kind of data, at least, we have other data. That's okay, we feel the same way with humanities. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? Go and ahead. and Mary ahead. Patello yeah. is always getting on us like, everyone has data. She's the chair of our department. <laughs> everyone has data. And so um, I think our governing leadership in this country is they're the odd people out. And they are representing us in ways that are not reflective of what the majority of the people think. And not that majority should always rule. We know that in this country. That could truly be a problem when the majority has um, <laughs> positions on certain, on certain, on certain um, issues. I think the other thing in political context that we're dealing with right now is that people are increasingly making transnational connections and understanding that what is happening in their neighborhood is connected to what's happening across the world. We can look at Springfield, Ohio. Right, and the Haitian community there, and people in in the in the in Springfield saying, "Wait, wait, 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 wait." That's not how we understand our neighbors. Mm -hmm. The way you all are talking about Haitians, that's not how we understand these folks. Like they are, they are neighbors. They're in our community, and they under, Unfortunately, they're <laughs> oftentimes reduced to workers, and their mm -hmm. value as workers, mm -hmm. right? Because Haitians shouldn't just be valued because they're good workers. That's absurd. The people's value is not just in what they produce. Their value is in being people, right? just being here. That's enough. That's enough. And so folks are making bigger connections around migration, around like, why are Haitians here? Why do they want to be here? Who brought them here? Oh, what is the United States doing in Haiti? All those things. Like People are making big connections in their organizing work. People are saying, don't buy the iPhone 16 because of what they're doing in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Just everyday folks. And to me, while there's so much devastation uh, happening across the world, I think that the, the possibility for a transformation is it, 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 it feels more and more possible because just everyday folk are making those connections. Um, and to me, that's uh, a big part of our political um, context that we're living in right now that I think is important to note that we can be rooted in our local context and understand how we're connected to people across the world. I mean, so well said. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you laid out the context in terms of this political moment beautifully. The only thing I would add, um, I, when I think about this question of like, where are we at now? I think back to like being a kid in the 80s and 90s and what movement looked like then, like what was speakable then. Yeah. You know, like knowing police brutality was a problem, but not being believed, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like not even having that be speakable knowing incarceration was a problem because my family was going through it. But there was no, you know, New Jim Crow had not happened. It wasn't 2012 yet. Like, That's right. the things that are speakable now. That's right. And that we have a vocabulary for to yes. talk about yeah. and understand. Yeah, yeah. That's right. yeah. The fact yeah. that we can proudly speak about Palestinian liberation. Couldn't do that now. five years ago. Five, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was everything but Palestine. That's the third rail in the impressive movements. No, 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 no. Whereas many of us have known for a long time and yet there wasn't the conversation happening. And so even though everything that we are up against, and you know, it, it seems, I mean, fascism, ecological crisis, reproductive justice, like you know, on every front there are challenges, and yet I wouldn't trade being in this movement for anyone that we've seen up to this point. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of, mm -hmm. I think people are more insistent now that we cannot leave anybody behind mm -hmm. as we're going towards freedom. You know, like disability justice is a non-negotiable now. We're talking about, you know, anti-ableism in our movements. We're talking about universalist design as a given. Trans rights 
You know, I mean, even, even you know, the conversations around marriage and equality and things like there's always this, again, a third rail. Are, tra are we talking about trans inclusion or not? Mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, across all these issues, coming up in the 90s, early 2000s as a student activist and organizer, you know, it was just a given that if you're in a movement for racial justice, there's gonna be patriarchy, there's gonna be heteronormativity, there's gonna be all of this. And so I think that's where I derive, you know, if, if there's a sense of possibility, mm -hmm. it's that our movements are much less compromising now in terms of who, who is the we in beloved community? Mm -hmm. And what is it really gonna to take to get free? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, the only, what that reminds me and what is so connected to you know, what I'm trying to work on now is that when you talk about that we, it's also how much we see in these movements, the building of coalitions. And you know, when we name what we saw happen in 2020 around um, fighting against anti-blackness and police brutality, it felt like more folks that just weren't black folks were out in that, when we talk about Palestinian liberation work now, and we see people working across coalitions, um, across kind of individual interests, but essentially showing up for each other. And so that part of the political landscape feels very relevant to what I'm trying to understand with this work too, because what does it mean when you're trying to look at the intersection like we talk a lot about this intersection, intersectionality, all the issues matter, they, they cross pollinate, but at the same time, how do we really map out how they matter? Mm -hmm. and, and in order to keep each other in conversation with, with one another, where we don't just get kind of frustrated that it's always, um, that the movement work feels like it's melded into not having some clarity around, yes, we need to show up for American Indian folks and the impacts of um, climate change or destruction of land and, and water. Um, and we need to show up for them, but not necessarily change, not talk about intersectionality in a way that it means that that very specific topic then has specific policy or organizing solutions. Um, like that's the messiness that I'm trying to figure out that feels very relevant to this current landscape, how we're showing up for each other, but how do we make sure that we keep some clarity around the different problems and the different solutions needed? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I write a um, Sunday night message every week um, for the, at the Ford School, and a couple weeks ago I talked about can we understand and address the thicket of the forest while also being attentive to the tree? Yeah. And can we hold both of those things in our hands? And it's, it's not a betrayal of one right. to focus on the other. Can we, can we do it at the same time? And what do you all think is involved in doing that at the same time? It's complicated, obviously. A lot more complexity and attentiveness to recognizing the complexity of multiple community struggles and at the same time allowing for the specificity of experience to also be honored and recognized. How do you all grapple with that? I mean, my grappling is essentially what came to my, I mean, it's, it's connected to, I don't have the answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't have the answer for the how, but I know that my frustration with um, what happens when we were just seeing the forest in LGBT, kind of inequity and disparity work. So mm -hmm. what kept happening is we would present these data and folks would go, oh, so if LGBT folks experience um, child welfare involvement at higher rates, incarceration at higher rates, poverty at higher rates, because that's what the data look like, then it must be that LGBT-related discrimination is the reason, period. Right, that's where the disparity is. So that's the driving reason. And so that was kind of seeing, in a way, the force, but kind of choosing the tree of interest mm -hmm. in a way that didn't have the evidence that people thought it had. You know, and it led me to ask questions like, well, okay, well, let's talk about this. You know, 
you said, so the answer to solving queer youth being overrepresented in foster care systems is to, you know, right away I started seeing like my work used where there'd be a press conference and LGBT movement groups would say, oh, so that means we need to make sure all those queer, uh, I mean, all those families of color need to stop rejecting their kids. And I was like, whoa, I don't think the data said that. Mm -hmm. Right, so why is that the tree you're picking out of this forest? Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, let's dig deeper so that we understand that that mix of issues. What it, you know, what is that at the intersection of LGBT youth of color? Um, if most of these, so the an, part of the answer is so if most of the, if we look at the data more, if most of these kids are coming into the system as children before they're five and eight years old then is it really about the LGBT status? Mm. Maybe that's why they can't get out. Mm. But that might not be the structural issue that got them in. Mm -hmm. And then we're back to you know, looking at Dorothy Roberts' work, looking mm -hmm. at the impact of structural racism on the child welfare system and the policing of black families in particular. So that's my wrestling with the forest and the witch tree mm -hmm. to, to focus on and, and when. Um, part of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I'm thinking back to some of how we tried to move at Detroit Justice Center and how the team is still moving in my absence. Mm -hmm. And part of that was getting really clear on our values and how we wanted to move together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Knowing that the challenges and the problems that came up any particular day were gonna be different and were gonna require us to move you know, in different ways, at different scales. But if we had certain commitments about how we were gonna to be together and what we were aspiring to, then we could stay true to those. And so I'm thinking of, you know, things like we value our relationships above all. We value the wisdom of intergenerational um, perspectives. Um, we move with joy, curiosity, joy and curiosity. You know, and, and you know, these, are, these sound like abstract things, but really these are you know, principles that you can choose <laughs> to, to draw upon. Um, you know, are we building power or are we creating dependency? Like that one, it's like, think about that every time you go to pick up the phone and call somebody. Like, should it be me calling this journalist or the senator, or should I be making the connection between them and the organizers? Mm -hmm. You know, you have hundreds of opportunities in a day to build power or create dependency, mm -hmm. um, to value your relationships above all or not. And so just taking that time to pause and move with intention and remind yourself of the values that you've committed to, that I think can be an anchor at least as you're wrestling with that problem that never has any one good answer, but you know how you wanna show up to it. Mm -hmm. We're very curious about the questions that you have. Mm -hmm. So we are going to open it up and we've got a microphone. And as you think, I'll put a question on the table while you <laughs> get your thoughts together. Cause I know I put you on the spot. I wanted yeah. to add well, maybe while we wait for someone to think of a question that both of you I think have reminded me, mm -hmm. you know, actually to you know, kind of bring in that analysis of how researchers, and it, like the, the exact ex right. example that Capitalism you gave mm -hmm. is the power dynamic for like, if a journalist wants to talk about yeah. the work, yeah. am I the right person or should they be talk, you know, and there's been more than one occasion where I've said, I think what you need is someone where that's their story, which is yeah. different than yeah. me telling you what the data said and I'm, I'm not here to, supplement or you know take over when a story is needed but a never ending reminder to mind that power dynamic mm -hmm. um yeah so i thank you both for yeah. making sure i bring that up yeah absolutely cuz it's so interesting mm -hmm. you know one of the questions i was going to ask so i'll ask it is <laughs> you know you all both are betwixt and between you have a foot in multiple worlds Mm -hmm. And some of those worlds come with different levels of power and different levels of legitimacy and different levels of legibility. 
and you know whether it's academia and the community work that you do, whether it's the legal professional work that you do, whether it's mm -hmm. you know film academia that you're moving into, but also the film world, and that has its expectations of mm -hmm. standards and expectations and legibility and et cetera. So I know so many of our students grapple with this question of wanting to make change and then navigating a large institutional structure called higher education, right? So I just wonder if there's any lessons learned of that betwixt and betweenness, that that you know, foot in both worlds, that mm -hmm. scholar and activist, that administrator and um, sociologist or community member or et cetera. You know, how do you, any lessons, any advice on that? Well, I'm uh, 39 and uh, I first got involved in student activism and student organizing when I was 18 in college. And uh, some of the things that we organized for, which I won't tell the whole story about, uh, 10 years later, I learned it was reversed. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things we focused on were not necessarily changing the institution itself and institutional culture and practices, but more so um, some Band-Aid solutions, right? So this is, these aren't the demands we made, but I'll just give some examples. More black professors. Um, and then there's also, uh, I don't know, um, funding, right? Uh, and then there's also committees, because the university is love a committee. Um, <laughs> they love to create a committee to stop you from getting what you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the one thing. They will create a committee to stop you to get from getting what task you want. Force, a so. task force, <laughs> right? <laughs> from what you want and what you deserve. So if just clarity about the kind of demands that you're making. Do they actually shift or have the possibility to shift power dynamics? Do they entrench current power dynamics? Or do they keep them the same? And some things you're going to want, they, they may do one of those. They may, like more black professors. Cool, yes, we should have more that have good values and are good teachers you know, and doing meaningful research. Yes, we should have that. But that doesn't change the institution. Right? That might get you more um, options for your advisors or your chairs and more mentors or recommendation letters or, uh, classes that uh, are intellectually stimulated, but that doesn't change the institution. Is it a worthwhile demand? Yes, but don't, let's not act like that's going to transform the institution. So having discernment around the kinds of things that you're demanding, right? If you're demanding divestment from web arms uh, companies, right? Great. Okay, what is the, yes, do that. And what is the structure of the funding of the board, the trustees? How are those decisions made at your university? And recognizing that it's not going to happen, speaking to cycles, in four years. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen in four years or six or seven. You know, a union, I don't know when they started organizing for a union in Northwestern for graduate workers, but we just won it last year. Mm -hmm. So it's highly unlikely in many cases that you will be the first or the last for a structural change at your institution. So I think that is like some of the, um, the things, I know students do, you know, like the, the divestment campaigns, people are doing it across the country and across the world, frankly, and many institutions have been successful. But that's like one part of a bigger thing and just being clear that the stuff, it, it is urgent and it deserves to happen right now. And it's not like, oh, you know, being complacent and saying it's going to, or accept what the university says when they say it's going to take a long time. There's a difference between understanding that the organizing can take a long time and understanding that the, the, the action needed to ha that's needed to happen to create the change doesn't actually take a long time. There's a difference between, and I wish I better understood that mm -hmm. as, a, as a younger organizer. I actually kind of just made that distinction right now <laughs> in, in real ways. <laughs> really, I like, know the first time I ever said that before. But I think it matters because I, I can remember saying in panels like, change doesn't happen overnight. Mm, that's not true. It can. Yeah. it can, but the organizing can take years. But the thing, mm -hmm. that don't take that long. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. It's funny, like, I mean, the wisdom that you just realized you had. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> 
You know, I mean, it reminds me of something that I've been thinking about and talking to more than one student about is it's great to be mission driven and to be focused on a topic, but there are so many tools and strategies. I mean, to understand the movement work has techniques, strategies, tools, that it is worth seeking out folks that are doing work in different ways even if it is not your favorite topic right now, even if it's not, I'm not saying, you know, go against your interests or, or values, but rather, you know, there might be some work that someone's doing on climate justice. And, you know, you know, I'm thinking in a very student way, you know, if, if that's a place where you could learn to write white papers and think of what do people do with that in ways that actually impact change, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not your main topic. You're, you know, more invested in, you know, economic development or neighborhood development. It's worth learning those tools, and I and I put that out there because I do think that not just students, but all of us, we tend to gravitate toward the topic and the mission, but to get like to do the kind of work that you're talking about took skill development. I mean, mm -hmm. that like you all have strategies and, and ways of doing that that people need to learn about. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think what this has made me think of when I am you know, more used to speaking with law students and policy students, but when I talk to them, I often think about we are drilled into thinking about precedent. Mm. The law is mm. all about precedent. And I encourage them instead to think about like what is your inheritance? Mm. Like, what did you already know about relationship building, about being someone who moves with joy and purpose forever coming to law school? Because I think whether it's policy school, social work school, mm -hmm. law school, it's all about making you forget that you know anything, <laughs> you know, or that you have some wisdom already about what it takes to show up in the world. And I think that there is just such a need to trust that. I mean, I hated law school. <laughs> and it was so often having these conversations with friends afterwards, you know, after classes, after seminars, like, how can you believe that they think that this is the case? How can you believe that they're not, you know, seeing racial justice as an issue? And all of those sidebar conversations became the innovation that was needed once we graduated. It became Detroit Justice Center, it became Law for Black Lives, it became Community Justice Project, you know, and so it's like there's wisdom there and don't be talked out of the fact <laughs> that that is precisely what is needed because it's on people who are students right now to push all of these areas further than yeah. they've been before. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is I think often about this question of who am I accountable to and how do I know that I'm accountable? <laughs> and so you know, I think you were talking about this question of power mm -hmm. and the power in some of the access that we get or, you know, and, and I think that, you know, we talk about accountability in this loose way, but no, 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 whose face can you picture? <laughs> like, like, if you are in a meeting and you don't get the, your agenda met, who's going to call you up really angry about you that? It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure you know, what do. meeting are you going to have to report back at yeah. next week? You know, just who are you in community with who is holding you accountable? And then I think it's, it's, it's hard to go so astray. I think a lot of the problems that we see in movements are people who don't understand their responsibility to community and to the collective and a sense of accountability. Mm -hmm. oh. Questions? Thank you very much for um, such a wide-ranging and, and yet profound kind of debriefing. Um, on the intersections here between policy and activism. I'm faculty here, um, not at the Ford School, but in LSNA, where I've been here for 25 years. And I have to say that one of the things that is so disturbing about the environment today is that I always felt when students, I, I always feel like my constituency are my students and that my activism is teaching them to say, hey, that doesn't sound right, <laughs> you know, and this is wrong. Um, we got a letter from our provost at the beginning of the year telling us not to express opinions. Uh -huh. So if you want to say racism is wrong, I'm pretty sure that's an opinion, right? Um, so 
we are starting to feel like we can't even, you know, say to our students some of the things that I feel are critical to my activism. So it's just a, it just seems like the point you made about seeing the long arc of justice for organizing versus, you know, the quick action is, is all the more important today because it just feels really in the educational environment where it just seems like the corporations rule. It just seems like it's just going to be even harder for anybody to protest, you know. So I guess that's, I, I don't know what I'm asking to hear, <laughs> whether like stick with it or um, <laughs> uh, pound them over the head or write rude emails, you know, um, which I will do all of. Um, but you, it, it just, it's just heartbreaking. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. I don't know if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, again, my mind goes to how to build power around this. And, it, and two, um, you know, in talking with students here and learning about the policy that was enacted over the summer around this vague definition of disturbance, you know, and, and in response to the encampment and the incredible organizing that was happening all of last year. And so it's like, you know, students are also facing this sense of how can we speak out? Um, how can we gather without this you know, nebulous excuse for police to show up and crack down? So I was like, what an opportunity for solidarity there. Mm -hmm. Whereas like students are feeling it, faculty are feeling it, staff are feeling it. I mean, it sounds like cause for a big old town hall meeting where people <laughs> decide together how to challenge this. Because it's, you know, on this campus, there are probably hundreds, if not thousands of people feeling their version of this. And in their offices or in their dorm rooms, you know, just freaked out about this. And so just like the more opportunities to come together and build power over and strategy around it. And I have nothing concrete other than my instinct is always, how do we build power together? I don't have anything to add to that. Uh, yeah, I, I I agree with yeah. you. I I, I um, sometimes suffer from the ooh, like lack of belief. Even as somebody like I'm doing this now like twenty years, mm -hmm. and I, I oftentimes I need to see somebody else doing something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for me to believe that it's possible. Even after being the person who's doing like one of the people doing the thing. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, like then demonstrates to other other people that it's possible, and so like feeling hopelessness or feeling despair, frustration. I think all that is normal. It's normal. Like you're a person, you have feelings, and that's okay. And there are other people who also share those feelings. To Amanda's point, it's like what do we do from that place? What what do we do? What become like what is possible from that place? And for sure, they're gonna do whoever runs or governs this university, um, they're gonna do um, wh what they're gonna do regardless of how people show up, whether you protest or not. So it's like, what do you wanna deal with? What do you wanna live with? And what is unacceptable? And I have been so inspired by the student organizing, um, the encampments across the world. Who expected that to happen? Nobody, nobody predicted it, however, it is related to ongoing student organizing that's been happening for at least the past decade, you know, named and unnamed. Um, that's been happening not just in SJPs or Students for Justice in Palestine, but their organizing and other organizations, the dissenters, um, and uh, other groups that have been organizing on campuses. And so, to just to Amanda's point, like I, I'm not even going to assume somebody's probably in a meeting right now talking about what to do next, you know? And so it's like, how do you make those connections on campus and continue to make those connections on campus with other like-minded people? Because I don't know how many people started at the beginning of your encampment. I imagine that it got a lot bigger over time. And sometimes it does just take a few people, a few annoying, <laughs> uh, steadfast people <laughs> um, uh, to, to, to take collective action. And you never know when it's going to ignite into something bigger. Mm -hmm. Who, like, no one knew mm -hmm. those early encampments were going to lead to an international yeah. movement of student encampments. So sometimes it's, I don't know, it's the cosmos, it's the right time, and it just, it just pops off. Mm -hmm. 
the beautiful thing too is, so I'm not on a campus at the moment. I mean, I am through through this, but you know, but not not actively teaching and things. But I remember some things I loved about campus organizing is it's this microcosm of the idea that people can bring what make you know like whatever brings them joy they can put to use for movements. So like yes, there are going to be roles for lawyers and challenging everything. I mean, these seem like all sorts of First Amendment violations mm -hmm. and things. But but don't let the lawyers be the ones who run with it. Right. You know like. There's room for the graphic designers who are going to make the subversive posters that go up around campus. There are going to be, you know, dancers. Don't you? Like, it's it's just like, you know, what are the many different ways? The radio stations. The radio stations. The journalists. Really the teach-ins. Yeah. The you know the role for faculty and like the history mm -hmm. of campus repression. Like, there are so many different ways for people to throw down in this moment. And I would just say like, let that imagination flow. Mm -hmm. Before this just becomes about the legal challenge, mm -hmm. <laughs> spoken that, as a lawyer. Right. <laughs> one, one, of the thing, one of the ways that I think about the 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 active activism in general, but um, campus <clears> activism, <throat> is we often think of it as uh, a set of demands and a response, a set of demands and response, and I want to encourage us not to reduce it to that, because in so many ways, it's actually a con it's a series. A multi multiple conversations. You even standing up and sharing how you're thinking is inspiring other people mm -hmm. to think about, well, how do I feel about this? Where do I agree? Where do I disagree? When, you, when we think about the number of people on this campus who knew nothing about this issue 365 days ago, mm -hmm. but now have information, have an awareness, are seeking, are asking people from different sides of the issue, well, what do you think about this and what's your experience? Just the level of awareness that has changed in the last year through the conversation. So I, you know, I, I totally recognize the, the desire for the, um, I don't want to reduce it to a zero sum, but sometimes it can feel like a zero sum for the demand and the response. But I don't want us to underestimate the power of the conversations oh, yeah. themselves oh, yeah. and how much has been learned and how many people <clears throat> are listening, even if you don't know that they're listening, in positive ways. Not in a surveillance way, but just in a, I was here, I was here, <laughs> but then I heard a comment that got me thinking, well, maybe here. And then I heard another comment that maybe got me back here. Then I heard another comment that got me here. And that movement of thinking I think has been, regardless of how you view the issue, I think that has been one of the unsung stories of the last 365 days we've been living. Because the number of people who can actually articulate what is this debate about is so different than where we were a year ago. I spoke to a group yeah. of black middle school students. I was invited to come like to speak to them by my um, by an alumni chapter of my sorority. Mm -hmm. They're like, what's going on in Palestine? And I was like, this feels like such a responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I felt more responsible talking to them than I did. Like I had to prepare more talking to them than I came prepared to talk to y'all. I mean, this is a lifelong preparation to be able to talk about this stuff for sure. But like the dedicated time to talk mm -hmm. to preteens? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, that's a, a huge responsibility. Right, yeah. And they did what I also wish I'd learned a lot earlier and practiced much more consistently as an organizer, and that's to be curious, to right. ask questions, always. You go up in the meeting, and you think you know what's going on, or I, I go in the meeting, and I think I know what's going on, the first thing I should always do is listen and ask questions mm -hmm. before I move with assumptions. Mm -hmm. And just like people being engaged and being curious. Being curious. My gosh, I think the world has changed. And just the in number so of, many ways. The number <laughs> the of people year. who have said, I read everything I can get my hands yeah. on yeah. on this topic. Yeah. And I want to know more and I have so many questions. That to me yeah. is, you know, a part of the work that we should recognize. Mm -hmm. um, even if we don't, even if we have frustrations with how the debate and how the activism, how the response to the activism, et cetera, plays out. Yeah. I'm going to turn it to, I think, yeah. Kyra, do you have a question?
Okay, great. <laughs> and this is Dr. Kyra Shahid. Yeah. Also, this is the Trotter team who are co-sponsoring today's uh, event for their Distinguished Leadership Series. Trotter team. Um, Can you all wave, please? This is a great group. We just love uh, partnering with Trotter. We love y'all, too. We love y'all back. I absolutely love all of this. I will not be on this mic long. You almost, y'all already really started answering my question. Um, but the question that I want to bring into the room is where might you all find, and there might be multiple ways that you respond to this question, but how do you build and maintain your sense of both hope and possibility? Um, what we see in our center, I think even in the question that we heard from our colleague, um, right, is this despair that really blocks us from thinking um, creatively, right? The anger, the turning into ourselves of thinking that things might never change, that the institution will always do what institutions do, right? That what's happening in Palestine was happening before we got here and it will continue to happen. And so people sort of lose hope that blocks creativity. So I'm curious, particularly because you all are in multiple roles, right? And you're doing this sort of betwixt and between where hope and possibility might get pushed out in one of those realms, more so in the other, of what do you do that really feeds your spirit in that way? Um, and how might you encourage students um, and other folks in this room to tap into those possibilities? That's the question. <laughs> you, know, to, you know, to be honest, I, it struck me how much, um, actually in the last year specifically, I turned to home more. And that was part of what not just kept my sanity, but brought debates and discussion about what was possible, what we understood, um, what we knew, what we wanted to know more about, mm -hmm. brought it out of social media mm -hmm. where discussions were not authentic and felt very unproductive and just brought it home, like debates with our teenager <laughs> and discussions with family, extended family, friends and colleagues that were closer. So, I mean, that, that was part of what did that. And, and seeing that there was some possibility for movement in thought gives me some hope. Um, but also, more than anything, it just kind of gave me a little sanity as to uh, remember what was important. Also, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that this is the first time I thought about it, but for many of you who, who look at critical race theory and, and when I think of Derek Bell's work and actually how meaningful that was for me <clears throat> to just remind us that the struggle is always going to be there and there's hope in resistance, regardless of whether it has the change I hoped it would have in the time span I hoped it would have. That, that does keep me going. Because um, I do see changes, and then like you mentioned earlier, then we see huge setbacks. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know, it's, it's kind of trying to un, we, we want, change, we want impact, but sometimes I have to disconnect the process from the evidence of the outcome, mm -hmm. for sanity's sake. Otherwise, if it was a requirement to keep going to see that outcome, then I wouldn't keep going. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like so, in my in my academic work, I mostly yeah. I sit through. Um, I study black placemaking uh, through historical, like archival research and literary analysis as well. I'm oftentimes sitting in like American coloniza colonization society records, just stuff from like the 1800s um, through like the early 1900s is what I spend most of my days looking at in my academic research. And so I'm reading letters, I'm, and unfortunately, many of the things, and one of the, the places I look at is Liberia, 
And I also look at um, what was Indian territory and is present day Oklahoma. Um, and s sadly and painfully, um, Liberia is a very similar example to Israel. And what I mean by that is that a nation state built through <clears throat> people's desires for home, who have been like on the, uh, the receiving end of a lot of violence and pain, and then in turn replicating systems of oppression. Right? People who have been deeply dispossessed. Um, in the case of Liberia, many people who were formerly enslaved. Right? In the case of Israel, people who experienced genocide. And things before that as well. So lots of similarities in the, the desires that serve as a catalyst and a foundation. Um, for a, an attempt to create home. And so it's heartbreaking. Like I'm, remi I'm in the 1800s and really the 17th, 1700s as well. And I thought I was gonna get away from slavery, like the history of slavery, and I didn't get away from it in studying Liberia and um, Indian territory. Um, but I'm living in 2024. And so I was like, oh my gosh. This is, this is, this is disorienting. And at the same time, I'm living in 2024 and I'm able to think, I have access to time and resources to think about these things mm -hmm. in this way. Like, as a black person who is not enslaved, like, I am not living in the conditions that my ancestors lived in, um, even while experiencing various systems of structural, like, experiencing structural impression, oppression, impacts of that for sure. But not in the same situation. So I'm in a, in a, and I'm in a time where there are other people asking similar questions or the same questions, making the same or similar observations. So I'm not alone. I'm not alone. There are other people thinking, how do we govern? How do we understand sovereignty? How do we understand belonging and home and do that without oppressing other people? And because I'm living in this moment and we have some both retrospect, and that's why I'm doing my project, because I'm interested in how we're thinking about governance now, um, how we're thinking about abolition now, and historical examples of that. And it's like, OK, so something else is possible. And what are the things that happened in the 1800s and the early 1900s that signaled to me that even under those conditions, mm -hmm. black people were making place and doing, experimenting with things? What can we learn from that? Right? And that's, that's, that drives my, my scholarly work. Um, and I, the other part, the contemporary part, I can't do that because I just got to write one dissertation. <laughs> but the historical, the historical stuff is what I'm focused on in this project. Um, and so it, it lets me, like, that our folks have been at this for a long time. And this happens to be my time when I'm in it. And it's like, OK, so how am I going to contribute to that? And hopefully, I can help change the terrain. Because the terrain has been changed. Yeah. It has been changed like over time. We are not in the exact same conditions as, eight, as 1822. Although there are things that are still happening, like imperialism still exists. Like there are things that didn't exist then that exist now. So the surveillance that we have at this level, all those things. So I absolutely have plenty days of hopelessness. Plenty. But it's the the student encampments, moments like that, that just like spike, that spark something for me um, that remind me of what's possible. So it's organizing. That's what actually, I took a five year break from organizing after BYP 100. Mm -hmm. It was um, um, Black for Palestine that got me back into organizing last year. Like I wasn't doing it and I stopped. And so, and it, that's what got me out of the bed because I was, I was, yeah, it got me like, OK, let me go do something with other people, take collective action, reignited some hope for me. Yeah. It's the same for me. I mean, I think whatever the issue is, whatever is happening, if you dig a little deeper, look for a couple more news stories, like there's somebody resisting. Yeah. There's somebody taking action. You know, people are being threatened with deportation while there are churches and mosques and they're providing sanctuary for people. There are, you know, every single issue um, tonight, for example, so I will disclose to folks, I was a law school classmate the same year as J.D. Vance. Oh. 
And so my uh, class listserv lit up today because <laughs> he's going to be on the debate stage tonight. Oh, that's And I said, what if all of our classmates threw down money for the Springfield Unity Fund and the Haitian Bridge Alliance? Mm. You know, in honor of our classmate. Yeah. <laughs> 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 And so, so whatever it is, like there, you know, I, I'm just heartened oh, by, okay, yeah. there are dozens and dozens of people yeah. who are gonna be taking some action in the face of what we're seeing. Yeah. And it's, it's that type of thing over and over and over. Um, I, would be miss if, I would be remiss if I did not talk about the role, so not just organizing, but visionary organizing. Mm -hmm. So I see my comrade and friend up there, Stephen Ward of the James and Grace Lee Boggs Center to Ooh. nurture community leadership. We're on the board <laughs> together. And, you know, Grace and Jimmy taught us about the value of not just organizing, but visionary organizing. So what is the vision of the world that you're fighting for, not just what you're tearing down? And so that is where I deeply draw hope from, is the people who are coming up with those visions right now and working towards them. You know, not just focusing on what are we defending ourselves against, what are we up against, but what are we building? in our communities. And I mean, Detroit is the site of the most visionary organizing on the planet, if you Ooh. ask me. <laughs> and so there's just so many examples. Uh, you know, people <laughs> building community land trusts, building worker-owned cooperatives, building, you know, figuring out you know, how do we have sustainable communities at the neighborhood level, at the state level. You know, like my mentor and friend Vince Warren asked this question of five generations from now, what will black people thank us for? And it's such a beautiful question. And it gets us out of this, like, yeah. what can we win 18 months from now? What can we win this academic year? And it's like, even if you're not going to stay in that place, let your imagination go to that place. Mm -hmm. And let that be your anchor to then come back and do the work of the day to day. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a wonderful, wonderful note to end on. I want to thank our panelists uh, and our, our CRJ visiting fellows. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank the Trotter House for your continued amazing partnership. Um, and finally, I want to thank the CRJ team, Managing Director Dom Adam Ooh. Santos, Ooh. Katrina Houseman is here. Uh, we have, do we have uh, Katrina? Oh yeah, and I just said, where's Angela? Angela's around here. Angela oh, okay. Nikoloff Nick, is here as well. Our postdoc, Christina uh, Fullerton Rico. We want to thank um, all of the fantastic work that the CRJ does on behalf of the Ford School. So thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just thought